man. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. Jesus, yeah, man. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. Jesus, yeah, man. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. So good, so so good to me. Jesus, now I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh 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 yeah. Yeah, we got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh 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 yeah. Come on. And righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I got love, joy, peace, and righteousness in the Holy Spirit. Oh.
I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting. Uh, there we go. All right. Good morning. As we begin our service today, let's all be standing as we sing Wonderful Grace of Jesus. The, the men at the Stand Firm are really sang out. It would be nice if maybe we did the same thing too while we're worshiping. <clears throat> <laughs> This time, 
meet your neighbor, greet your neighbors and talk to somebody you don't know. <laughs> All right. Sweet, sweet spirit.
prayer for our time of communion. Let's be singing, It is well with my soul. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. Yesterday, we had the opportunity to spend some time in Colorado Springs with, with my daughter, and uh, we needed to do some shopping for some birthdays and a, and a few other things, but one of the things we were shopping for was uh, for her because she um, got a new job, at which we thank everybody for the prayers for those, and, and she got a new job, and so I wanted to buy her some new clothes. I actually like shopping for clothes. I, I love taking my daughter and my wife shopping for clothes, and more accurately, I like buying clothes. Four hours of wandering around the mall without anything is a failed hunt. And so I, I love buying. And so we went into a store. She had a lot of success. And, and when she was done, she handed me the bag. Because there was no, no question that the dad was going to pay. That's what I do. And so whenever I take my, my daughter or even my son and his family out, there's really no question. I'm going to pay for it. And the funny thing is, and, and I want to. 
The funny thing is I find the same thing with my own dad. I'm in my 50s, and when we go out to eat or something, he usually pays. In fact, it would come to the point where he will secretly talk to the waitress before we sit down that he gets the bill. That's his pleasure to do so. It's my pleasure to do so. So I find it funny that a lot of times I find myself standing before my heavenly father, for, before Jesus, pulling out my own puny wallet, wanting to pay for my sins. Something that I have no ability to pay for, but I want to pay for, for some reason. And so we're going to come to a time right now where we're, we are simply going to remember what was done for us. We're going to hand Jesus a shopping bag, and we're going to thank him for paying. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for all that you've given for us and all you paid for us. We could not pay for it, but you did. May we be grateful, and may we be willing just to hand it to you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we give back to you in the form of money and time, talents that we have that you've given us. We give back to you, Father, as a form of worship. You've paid it all for us, but we did give back to you as a form of worship and adoration for all that you've done for us, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, it is a beautiful morning, crisp and clear and cool, and there's no wind, and that's really nice. Trees putting on their jewelry, changing to yellows, gold, silvers, ruby reds, all kinds of colors. And it's beautiful to see those colors in the river bottoms and in our yards and neighborhoods. We thank you for such beauty. And many of the birds that grace us with their presence in our gardens during the summer have headed south because they know the seasons have changed and will continue to. And they're going to where it's warmer and food supply is more plentiful. And there they'll winter, and when the time is right, they'll start migrating back up into our neighborhood. And that's a welcome sight, and we thank you. Father, in our lives there are many seasons, and sub-seasons within those major seasons. From birth until we reach eternity, so much occurs. And yet, Lord, when we consider the length of our days, it seems like when we're young that 20 is really old, and then 30 becomes really old, and then 50 and 70, and then 80. When we look back, those of us who have more age than others, we wonder what's happened in the seasons of life with us and to us and through us. And we all realize we've made many poor decisions. I pray you'd help us to use your wisdom to make wiser ones. We all have chosen to yield to temptation, which has led to sin. I pray you'd help us to resist temptation, to divert our eyes and our minds and our ears to that which is good for us and best for us in your sight. And at times we feel alone, whereas we used to be surrounded by classmates and teammates and family. But there are many others who are feeling alone, and we can, in this season, find someone to love into and to love in your son's name. And our health has changed from being able to jump over walls and fences without any problem till we need a set of ladders. We need to find another way around. So help us in our seasons of life to adapt to what we have, but always to remain grateful for whose we are. You know us well, your Lord, whether we're younger or older. Every one of us has been given talents and gifts and abilities, some yet to be discovered, whether we're younger or older, some that are well used and well worn like an old Bible, some that have been put on a shelf, some that have been ignored, some that are unwanted. Forgive us for being selfish. Help us instead to be selfless with an attitude of gratitude for every day we have and every hour we have because we never know when our last breath will come, when we will last see our husbands or our wives or our parents or our children or our siblings or our grandchildren. Help us to appreciate every day that you have made and the position you have placed us in as your ambassadors of Jesus Christ and your love. We give to you the past because there's nothing we can do about that. It's done. And we give to you our now and we give to you our tomorrow, asking that our now and our tomorrow would be God-guided and God-infused with mercy and hope and love and generosity and forgiveness and mercy and so much more. We pray for Dick Ramsey and the Ramsey family as Sue passed away a couple of days ago, and we just ask you to be with the family as they mourn and grieve and prepare for her services later this week, ones that will honor you and honor a lady who loved to serve you, loved to pray, loved to encourage others no matter what her personal situation was. We thank you for that. 
We ask you to be with those recovering from surgery, those like Ray Gilbert who are looking forward to surgery in the near future, guard surgeons and all the staff in the procedures, all the patients in the recovery. And we pray for a family, uh, a foreign family who are involved in a really nasty accident last Friday, last Wednesday. And that you be with them in their different hospitals as they recover from severe injuries that chaplains at the hospitals will be able to bring something of the love and grace of Jesus to them, that out of uh, very close to tragedy, uh, new life spiritually would come. Thank you for the great team at PMC who uh, poured into the hospital to take care of them, many of them off shift, just being there to meet the needs. We thank you for their love, for their job, and for the people they deal with on a regular basis. Thank you. And as we go into the sermon, the meat of the message, we pray that your spirit would speak to each of us as you know we have need, that we'd pay attention, and that you'd bring about in us with our choices the changes that you see that we need. So thank you for loving us so richly and deeply. As each of us have need, those who are in this room this morning and those who are watching online, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's a beautiful, isn't it just a beautiful day? I was driving uh, north yesterday morning early, and it was wonderful to see cottonwoods turning from green to gold and oranges and all the colors and uh, not as many birds around and a flock of turkeys huddling together to keep warm and waiting for Melody to go and hunt them and everything else. A uh, uh, beautiful, beautiful time. And I'd ask you to be in prayer for Kevin. Uh, he's preaching at the McClave Church again this morning, and a uh, second time we ask you to pray for him, that God would uh, speak into him and through him to what the congregation there needs as they go about a variety of changes. They've left, the, as many have, the Methodist Church denomination and have become a, an independent congregation, and that's a big changeover uh, for the families there, so we ask you to be in prayer for them. And that's really so much of a heart of the gospel message of Jesus Christ in the book of Acts. There wasn't any model of church to model the new church after, really. They had the Jewish religion. They had all the rules and regulations and the rituals that they went through on a regular basis. All the things they did repetitiously, they could say them in their sleep, they could do them in their sleep. It was a part of the ritual of life, and their religion guided everything that they did from their relationships with fellow Jews, half-Jews, the Samaritans, to the Gentiles, uh, men to women, adults to children, how they did their business. Everything was regulated by the Jewish religion, both the rules of God given in the commandments given to Moses, not just 10, about 612 of them, uh, the guided life, but also their uh, human developed rules, which weren't necessarily godly. They weren't necessarily bad, um, but many of them were. But what they did and the rule and regulation is they actually prevented people coming into a personal, intimate relationship with God. And we understand from Jewish history that reality is very few people had an intimate, personal relationship with God. It was a religion of doing and being and following the rules and making sure you check the list, kind of like Santa Claus, but worse. Because, you know, Santa Claus checks his list. I don't know when. I was hoping like it was at 1 a.m. in the morning on January the 1st, and then he'd just let the rest of the year slide. Doesn't that sound better than right before Christmas time? Because he's got a whole 12 months of history to work on. So <clears throat> for the Jew, it was much like that, a god of regulation, a, a, a religion of ritual and regulation and not relationship. And when Christianity came... It changed things dramatically. They went from the ordinary, everyday uh, stuff of life that we went through and they went through to a religion that was based on relationship with someone whom they saw and they interacted with and they actually experienced those generally who lived in Jerusalem and surrounding areas. And um, when you think about Jesus' life, he never really went more than 50 miles apart from his little trip to Egypt uh, when he was a baby. He never traveled more than about 50 miles from Jerusalem. That was his sphere of influence. 
but look what he did with those 50 miles, and look what he did with the relationships. So the religion of the Jew changed from ordinary to extraordinary, uh, and the people who came into contact with Jesus and came into contact with the, the gospel changed from ordinary everyday people into an extraordinary everyday people. They looked the same, they sounded the same, they did the same work, they did their routine, but the heart of who they were changed absolutely dramatically. I'm going to read um, Acts uh, 3.17 now, brothers. I know that you acted in ignorance about the crucifixion of Jesus, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through the prophets, saying that this Christ would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come out from the Lord, may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Christ who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. He must remain in heaven until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from among his people. Indeed, all the prophets from Samuel on, as many as have spoken, have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made to your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. And when God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. In that sermon, uh, another message from, from Peter and John and the others, they iterated again to the, the Jewish people that uh, Jesus and his message was not something that came out of the blue, not something that was a mystery, not something that was a great surprise, but something that was purposed by God from Genesis onwards. All of the Jews would have been aware of the prophecies of the Messiah. They were taught to them from the youngest age of being able to understand and be cognizant of things. They knew that, and they knew scriptures because they memorized them. Most were literate. So they had to memorize dozens and dozens, if not hundreds and hundreds of different verses. They knew the prophecies of the Messiah, and the Jewish nation yearned for that Messiah to come because they had a picture of what he would be like. And that is a mighty warrior savior coming not as a spiritual leader so much as one who had come or was going to come to restore the nation of Israel to becoming the dominant God-blessed nation in the world. This savior would get rid of the Romans, he'd get rid of all oppression, and they knew all nations would come and worship eventually in Jerusalem and give homage to the God of the Jew, and they would be honored, and they would be wealthy and powerful and influential. But that was never what God said in his Old Testament the Savior would be or the consequences of that Savior, what he would do and what he would accomplish for the nation of Israel. It was always about restoring an Adamic relationship between human beings and our Creator God, always restoring a relationship. You remember Adam and Eve walked in the garden physically with God. They knew Him and they were not afraid. And that's always been God's desire for us, that we would walk in an intimate personal relationship and not be afraid because of the love relationship He has blessed us with in a phenomenal way. In this message in the end of chapter 3 and into, uh, I guess it will be into the consequences in chapter 4, we'll come on to in a minute, we understand that uh, Peter and John used those Old Testament prophecies that all the Jews would have been aware of to show, to give proof, to give evidence that all of these prophecies were ultimately fulfilled in this Jesus of Nazareth whom they knew of, many of them knew, and the nation knew about because he really messed things up. He broke all the religious rules and mores, all the traditions of the fathers, and yet... <clears throat> Peter and John and the other disciples knew that the Jewish nation needed to hear the truth, capital T. There are many truths in our world. There's only one capital T truth, and that is God's truth. 
But there are many other truths in our world. We know the truth that one and one always equals what? Two. Two and two always equal what? Four. You're good. We won't take you beyond that. But we know those, and as one of my friends who's a math professor says, uh, math is the only subject that doesn't lie, but liars use math. Just look at used car salesmen and politicians. What can you say? Um, But math doesn't lie. And the prophecies of God don't lie. They always end up being fulfilled in God's will in God's time. Now, did any of the Jewish nation anticipate that between the end of the last prophet of God and the next prophet of God, there'll be a span of 400 years? No. But that was a part of God's plan. And I think it was to make it so that when God's prophet did come, which was Jesus' cousin, what was his name? John. Yeah, we call him John the Baptist, John the Immerser. Uh, When John came, there would be such a significant difference from there being no prophet and 400 years of silence from God that the nation would go, whoa, look at what happened. And so in the messages that the early disciples gave when they preached and when they taught, they showed all of Scripture and all the prophecies and how Jesus fulfilled so many of them. And I say so many because Jesus had not fulfilled all of them, such as Jesus has not yet come back the second time. And people say, well, when are the end times coming? And we say the end times came when started when Jesus was resurrected and went back up to be with God in heaven. That's when the end times started. We're in the end times. We have been since that occasion. But when does Jesus come back? We, we don't know. The Bible gives us indication in the New Testament that when every nation and culture group have had the opportunity to hear about Jesus and respond, that's a sign that Jesus will come back. Plus, there's going to be a really loud trumpet. Really loud trumpet. And I don't know how loud it's going to be, but everyone in the world is going to hear it at the same time. That'll be even louder than some of the trucks that go by my house on the back of 6th Street early in the morning, 1 o'clock in the morning at night. The Jewish audience needed to hear the truth. And when they heard the truth, many of them recognized that between the prophecies and experience in the life of Jesus, yeah, he did fulfill so many of those prophecies. Has anyone else filled one of them? And the answer is No. And so that led to the belief of many, many more people. Every time they preached, every time they taught, dozens and hundreds and sometimes thousands came to a realization that this Jesus of Nazareth was in fact Jesus, the Messiah of God. And they gave heart and life. They recognized that the truth from God was real and they applied it to their lives and their lives would change forever. As a result of this message, uh, remember Peter said in in 319, repent and turn to God that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Don't you remember how good it feels when you've been out working somewhere, whether it be inside or outside, and you know that feeling when you're sweating, you're grunging, it feels like just yick. You feel yuck, and you know no one wants to be near you because you smell you, and if you smell you, other people are going to smell you a lot stronger than you smell you. Does that make sense? And you understand what it's like when you come in and you flip the shower switch on, and the shower gets to the correct temperature, which for me is cold, and then you get in, and you just stand there, and it's like, ah. You feel refreshed. And then you get the soap on or the lava thing and and clean your stuff off and you get out of the shower and ah, you feel refreshed. And, And that's what Peter and John and the others are talking about. A time of refreshing comes when we know what it's like we feel. Don't we feel clammy when we're dirty and sweaty and grimy and arfy? You know, it's like be covered in wheat dust harvest time. That's a horrible thing, isn't it? Wheat dust is about the worst dust there is. Gets everywhere. My Oh, don't go there. Um, evil, evil, evil. But yeah, you guys need to stop growing Milo and grow weeds. We're really good at weeds. If money could be made from weeds, you guys would be really wealthy, wouldn't you? <clears throat> yeah. Anyway, we know what it's like. And so refreshing from God, we know what it's like to be covered in dirt and grime and stuff. 
And when we accept Jesus into our life, all of that is removed even better than the best cleaner there is of body because Jesus takes the inside. And a part of that, which we talked about last week, is the understanding that when we hear the good news of Jesus, that Jesus is the fulfillment of so many prophecies, some yet to come, that we need to react to that truth, capital T. Do we accept him as our personal Lord and Savior, or do we reject him as personal Lord and Savior? I know a number of individuals <clears throat> whom I've met over the years who have heard the gospel explained to them very, very simply. It's not a difficult, complicated story. It's just idiot preachers and others who make it that way. But when they've heard this, say, yeah, I know this is the truth, but I choose to not accept it for whatever reason. And I can't get my hands around that, my mind around that. If you know and recognize it's truth, why would you choose to not accept it? Well, for some... They didn't want to give up what they had because they felt what they were giving up was less than what they gained. Okay, what do you really have that compares to anything that God gives you in his love and grace and mercy? Some didn't want to give up control of their lives. They wanted to be their own small G God with their own small T, truth and many other reasons. <clears throat> Some uh, didn't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior because they were overwhelmed with the guilt of sins that they had committed. I know one who is angry at God because their spouse passed away, and God took him. And so why would you give your heart and life to a God who took your spouse away in their mind? So there are many reasons that we do that, but repentance is a crucial factor of that, and I won't go into much more than we, than we dealt with last week, but repentance is crucial. Changing from living how we are living and that which motivates us and guides our life to that which motivates us through love and hope and mercy and God's involvement in our life. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And truth is, if you're anything like me, and thank God most of you aren't, we don't like hearing the truth. Really, do we? I don't like to hear about my feelings. I don't like to hear about my faults, my guilt, my sin. I don't like to be reminded of all that I've done that is wrong. But truth is, I ask God every day to show me those things where I'm at fault, where I sin, where I fail and fall and everything else so that I can repent because truth, the truth of God, big T, should lead us to a repentance and a recognition that much in our life is not as God would want it to be for us and maybe even as we would want it to be for us. And the only way to be cleaned is to get in God's shower, to get in his bath and let Jesus' death and resurrection clean us, wash us, make us new, make us right with God. And repentance is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that was the crux of the messages of all the disciples. The resurrection of Jesus is the crux of salvation, and crux means cross. It's the crossroads. Have any of you here never gone, never been to a crossroads when you've been driving? Anyone never been to a crossroads? Okay, <clears throat> have any of you been to a crossroads where someone or something has removed the signs? <laughs> what do you do when you get to a crossroads and there's no signs? Someone took them down. How do you know which way to go? Well, you obviously won't go back to where you came from because where you came from is part of the reason why you're going a different direction because you want to get somewhere else. But imagine a crossroads with three other crossings. Do you go left? Do you go right? Do you go forward? How do you know unless the signposts are there? Simple little things, signposts aren't there. I remember my dad said in <clears throat> World War II that many of the French resistance too, and the Italian resistance he worked with <coughs> um, would mess around with the Germans. And when the Germans weren't around, someone would get up and they'd change the signs for towns. And so the Germans would go left and they were supposed to go right. And that caused confusion and many other things. Just a simple little signpost because they didn't know where they were going. There are many signposts we have in life about how God wants us to live and how much God loves us and cares for us and provides for us and is there to be our Heavenly Father if we would. And all we have to do is to follow those signposts. And one of them is 
God's resurrection of Jesus, which in many ways is the greatest miracle the world has ever known, raising a dead man to life to have him walking around for 40 days. Hey, Jesus, yeah, he was killed, he was crucified. That, that, that's, that's him there. The one who is killed and put in a tomb for three. I know it sounds, yeah, th that's him. Hundreds of people saw him <clears throat> walking around. One New Testament letter says over 800 saw him at one time. He was there. The resurrection is at the center. No resurrection, no Christianity, no salvation, no eternity with God, no God in us now. And what would we be like without that gift of God? So repentance is crucial for our relationship with God. Secondly, chapter 4, verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. And they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail to the next day. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, elders, and teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and the other men of, high, of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and are asked how he was healed, then know this and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone the builders rejected, which has become the corner capstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, uneducated, Ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that the men had been with Jesus. The Jewish leaders were really disturbed uh, about these Jesus followers, John and Peter and the others. They were disturbed that they were continuing to preach the same message that Jesus preached. And they were disturbed, not because of anything else, except that Jesus was a troublemaker. And he was the biggest troublemaker the Jewish leaders had ever experienced, worse than the Romans or the Babylonians or anyone else, because he was upsetting their apple cart of power and wealth and influence. They were the leaders by default. It was a family affair. The high priests were chosen from the family of high priests, and they had a nice little gig going. They took percentages of the offering. They had extra taxes on the people. They ruled everything that went on until Jesus came, and he literally turned the temple apple cart upside down. My father's house will be called a house of prayer, but you made it a house of thieves and of robbers, which they were. And so when you lose your power and someone threatens you, you retaliate against that person. And a large part of Jesus' death was nothing to do with God and spirituality. It was to do with man rejecting being found guilty of their sins, of having their power questioned and their wealth removed and their purpose for being released. Same today. And so Jesus was a huge threat, but they knew that they took care of the problem when they crucified Jesus. And they were standing there through the trial, and they were standing there at his crucifixion saying, got that problem taken care of. Thank you. Let's get back to business. And <clears throat> for 40 odd days, things were pretty good. Then they started hearing rumors. Rumors about a resurrected Jesus. Well, they paid off the soldiers who were sworn to guard the, the tomb in case anyone would come and steal from it. They paid them off. They took care of that. But then just like, 
little blobs all over Jerusalem. They started hearing word of Peter and John and the early disciples preaching that Jesus isn't dead, that he's resurrected, and rumor was going around that he'd appeared to the disciples in an upper room, that he was seen walking around, that some of the dead, when he was resurrected, came back to death, from death to life as well. And so we took care of the leader. We cut the head off the snake, so the snake is dead, right? No. The disciples, the followers, were empowered by the Holy Spirit to be what Jesus was in every way, shape, and form. So, if cutting off the head of the snake didn't take care of matters, then let's take care of those followers of Jesus. We'll take care of them. So that's why they arrested Peter and John. They were the leaders. Take care of the leaders, and the sheep go every which way, don't they? You take care of the matriarchal sheep. You take care of the ram. The sheep have no leader. They become a threat no longer, and so that's why they arrested Peter and John. What was the result of the preaching of the disciples? Hundreds and hundreds gave their lives to Jesus. <clears throat> and it's an interesting comment. When Peter and John were arrested, and they questioned them about why they're doing what they're doing, and interesting, the question was, by what authority do you preach, do you teach, do you do the things? Because for them, they were the only authority in Jewish life. They were the high priests, the scribes, the scribes, the Pharisees, the scribes, the priests. They were everything to the Jewish nation religiously. And these two men and the others were usurping their authority. We don't need your authority. Our authority comes from God and God alone, just as it did in the life of Jesus. And if God challenged your authority, small t truth big t with big t truth, then God using us does exactly the same thing. And we read in chapter 4 <clears throat> that all of these Jewish religious leaders recognize that John and the others, John and Peter especially, were ordinary, everyday, uneducated men. They couldn't read, they couldn't write. They were illiterate. And what kind of a threat can they be to the most highly organized, educated group of leadership abusers in any nation around? They could mess things up. Not by your authority, by God's authority. They recognized they had been with Jesus. And I can't imagine their emotion when they realized and remembered what trouble Jesus had caused them and now it wasn't just one, it was hundreds and hundreds, thousands of people who were filled with the same spirit, who had the same passion, the same desire to lead people to God through a relationship with Jesus, through repentance, confession, and so on. It took away, it made absolutely unnecessary the Jewish religion. Jesus basically said, all that you live for and have lived for is worthless. It has been replaced. Some of you are old, old enough to remember the old way to open a car window. Remember that? <clears throat> or you had the little window in the front door, and you had a little latch that you would turn, and you'd push that open, and depending whether you wanted little wind or you wanted a lot, you could turn it all the way around so it came, bugs and all came in your window. I remember cars back home with the whole front window dropped down, and that was your air conditioning but you couldn't put it back up again when you were driving. You had to stop and then turn the little latches on the top and you'd have your front windshield again. <clears throat> remember those things. Reclining seats. Do you remember your first reclining seats and your children playing with them? Well, you stopped playing with it, but it's so much fun. We've never had those before. And you remember fitting seven people in the back seat and a couple in the trunk? <clears throat> and you remember what air conditioning was. It was the... <clears throat> and you remember your first air conditioning. Remember when power steering came in? When I came over to America, I'd never dri I'd driven a Jag before, but that was different and wasn't mine. Um, but I remember coming over to America and power steering. Lori and I were out on a date going to a cinema with a couple of friends in the back seat. Was, I think there's a Plymouth, an old kind of Plymouth. <laughs> Enough said, right? Plymouth. I don't know why it was called Plymouth, but it was. And uh, we were going to the cinema down in Norfolk, Nebraska. And the stop sign went from green to orange, so I put on the brakes. I'd never experienced power brakes before. <laughs> that was my first time. And we stopped very quickly. 
And Todd and Marla, who were in the back seat, I looked around and said, sir, and I couldn't see them. They were in the footwell behind the drivers and the front passenger. I'm not exaggerating, ask Laurie, it was true. Uh, and they got themselves up and said, well, the brakes worked. And Laurie kind of looked at me like, ah, maybe I'll drive next time. Do you remember power brakes and power, you remember non-power steering? So changes occur, don't they? And maybe we complain and whine at first, but we understand changes often enough for our benefit, sometimes not. And those are simple, easy things over time. And that's nothing compared to the change that the Pharisees and scribes and high priests experienced with, number one, Jesus, and then his disciples. It was earth-shattering. It made them absolutely non-functional and worthless in the society that Jesus brought in. That's the kind of difference. So that's why, a reason why they arrested Paul. And the result, interesting, they continued to preach and teach nothing about Jesus and his resurrection and the difference he made in their lives. And thousands heard the message, and thousands became Christians through their message and their ministry. It was an extraordinary power in so many ways. And that's the extraordinary power of the ordinary. When we look at these men, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men were with Jesus. It's interesting <clears throat> that in the early church of the first two or three hundred years, very few of the wealthy and the powerful became Christian because to become a Christian meant they often needed to let go of all that they had. And when you have a lot, that's a lot to release. It doesn't mean that God can't use your power and your position and your wealth for his glory and praise. I've seen it many times. But it's a threat to how they've lived. But these were ordinary, everyday people. And what made them extraordinary in many ways was just their willingness to let God and his spirit make them what God wanted them to be. Servants as Jesus was. He who wants to be greatest amongst you must be the what? Servant of all, just as Jesus was. And that should mark even today the church of Jesus Christ. We don't go to church or involved in any congregation of what it gets for me. I, I remember some people I talked to a number of years ago, they come to church <clears throat> uh, for quite a while, and then they suddenly stop coming. And, and after about three or four weeks, or someone said, hey, what's going on? We missed you. And they said, well, you didn't give us enough business. I said, so you came to church so that you get more business. Well, no. So I said, you're going to another church. Well, yeah, and we get a lot more. I say, well, we wouldn't want you here if you just come here for business. It's not about what we get. It's about what we give, our worship and our praise to Jesus and that we recognize as ordinary, everyday people, God pours into us so we can pour into the world and we can be servants of God in the world just as Jesus was. Who did Jesus spend his time with compared to the religious righteous and the rule followers and creators and the ordinary, everyday people? Who did Jesus spend his time with? Ordinary, everyday people. And they came to him by the thousands. And Peter and John worked with the ordinary and everyday people and certainly worked with leadership too until they shut them off. And as they served and as they preached and as they taught, thousands upon thousands came to the Lord. And it's the same message. The message to the people was Jesus is the Messiah of God. Jesus of Nazareth is Lord and Savior. It's not complicated. And that's the same message today. What's different today? really nothing. Just the buildings we have, the transportation, how our towns look, our clothing. We don't wear togas and robes and things anymore. We don't ride on single horses. We have lots of horses that get us to work and get us to church. Some of you have 300 horses. Some of you have 500 horses, uh, depending on the vehicle you have. But the message of Jesus Christ is the same. The issues in the world of, of Jesus' time and the early disciples, they're no different. We have the same issues today. But the only way to change the world's negative issues and impact <clears throat> is not through politics and policy, who we elect, although that is important. It's as we as the church live out our faith relationship with da God daily. Teaching and preaching, sharing God's word from our experience, no matter how limited it may be, and leading them to Jesus through telling the story. Um, Laurie and I were at a couple's house on Tuesday night for supper. 
And <clears throat> they told of an interesting story. Remember I, I gave you some homework two weeks ago? To ask at least one person what they know about Lamar Christian Church. I've had quite a few responses already. Some of you are OCD. You ask seven people. Seven is a godly number. It's a whole number. So don't go more than seven. Don't go less than seven unless it's one. Or three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three is good as well. It's very spiritual. And it is interesting. Uh, this couple got into a conversation with, with a person. The, the woman of the couple went up to a person and said, I, I've got an assignment from church uh, to ask some people some questions. Would you be willing to ask, answer a question? And the person said, sure. And, and what do you know about Lamar Christian Church? Well, I've just been in town a very short while. I really don't know anything about anything or anyone about anyone. <clears throat> and then the woman just kind of started tearing up. And the woman of the couple said, hey, what, what's going on? And that simple question led to a meeting of, I think, 30 to 45 minutes with a person who had gotten out of jail, a woman, and had nothing and no one. And Isn't that a great way to do a survey? That that couple were in the right place at the right time under God's direction asking a simple question. What do you know about Lamer Christian Church in Lamer, Colorado, where there's nothing to do? And that led to a conversation where a woman who had had a really rough life and made some really poor choices in life had an opportunity to share her heart need with a couple who certainly weren't expecting that. They were looking for a one-minute answer or a 20-second answer. Nothing. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Let's get on our way. And prayerfully, that woman will come to a service <clears throat> and we can greet and we can love and we can share the compassion of Jesus. The early church turned this world upside down in a perf powerful way. They went from an ordinary group of people to extraordinary because of the power of the Holy Spirit working in Jesus, worked in them, and it turned the world upside down. And I'm ready for some turning upside down. Our world needs to change in so many ways. And it can if each of us is willing to let God have control and be who God has created us to be. Every one of us has the ability to share what we know about Jesus with another. All of us have that ability. The issue is our willingness. <clears throat> Will we? And here's what I know from those who have nervously asked other people, they said, after the first time I asked the question, I started looking for other people. Just like I just got excited about it. He, even the person who said, well, Lamar Christian Church is full of hypocrites. Of course it is. What better place is there for us than to be in church worshiping God, who helps change us from hypocrites into Jesus followers? We all have problems. And anyone who says we're a hypocrite is also a hypocrite themselves because everybody is in some way, shape, or form. It's like the guy who says, I really love Ram and the Cummins engine, the Cummins transmission, but they drive a Chevy. We're all hypocrites in some way, shape, or form. But the excitement of being able to share Jesus in a non-threatening way, just to love, just to partner with someone, is huge. And who knows, but out of this simple survey, that one or two people might start attending church and they might give their heart and life to Jesus because you had the courage to ask a question and to receive their answer without being offended or anything else, just to say, thank you so much. Would you be willing someday, if we change, exchange numbers, for me to sit down and tell you what really goes on at Lamar Christian Church so you know the truth, capital T, from what you've heard and what you've experienced? And who knows, but out of this, you may have the privilege of leading someone to Jesus as an ordinary, everyday person who God has made extraordinary. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your love, your grace, your mercy, for all that you are. You're an astounding, astounding God. And I thank you, Lord, for the, the book of Acts, as we call it today, which simply notes something of the work of the Holy Spirit in changing men and women's and youngsters' lives from what they were, ordinary everyday people. They still were in many ways, but they were transformed into the image of Jesus by their willingness to lay themselves before you, to confess their sins, to repent of their sins, and to live differently than the world because they'd experienced Jesus somehow because someone shared Jesus with them. These few Christians changed the world within 50 years of Jesus' death so that all of the Mediterranean and North Africa had heard about Jesus somehow. May we be found equally, equally servant-hearted as they were. 
And may you use us equally to change the communities in which we live. In Jesus' name, amen. So we come to invitation time. As always, if you need leadership to pray for you, they'll be happy to come down and listen to your need and to pray for you, take you off to another room and do that. If you need to give heart and life to Jesus today, today's a brilliant day for doing it. So let's stand and sing our invitation song. If you need us to pray for you, you need to give heart and life to Jesus, please come forward at this time. Yeah. Mm-hmm.
perfect song for today. Thank you. Father God, as we go out into your world, please may your grace and mercy and the power of your spirit go with us and in us and through us out into a painfully hurting world that relationship at a time, word at a time, action at a time, we can influence someone for Jesus. In your son's name, amen. And remember, this afternoon we have our fall fair fling thing in the fellowship hall and outside. Lots of fun games, cornhole championship and popcorn and candy cane, whatever that stuff is that's pink and obnoxious, made of sugar at fairgrounds. A great time this afternoon. Be here. We'd love to have you all here. Thank you. Have a great, great, superbly wonderful day. Amen.